interactive seminar today, and that's why you've got the question sheets to ask, because we'll, there'll be questions as we go along. Um, and if you, at the end of the session, fill it, put in the completed sheets at the end, it would be great. There are some prizes to win during the day. Um, so that's very good. Thank you very much anyway. But I'd just like to say, um, this is not, uh, I've had been very, very lucky to have some supportive people on the way on some of these trips, including Mark Nebels, uh, David Smith, and a few other people from Agriculture Victoria. And also want to talk about um, one of the few experts in Australia who's actually working in this idea, in this field of uh, detection and detection uh, probabilities, and that's Cindy Hauser from Melbourne University. Uh, who's one of the few experts in Australia on this field. Um, so I suppose, how did this come about, or how did I start working on this project? It started about 10 years ago, when um, me and my partner bought a 50-acre block of bush up in, uh, up in uh, Gippsland. And although I work on insects and plants during the week, what I also do during the weekends is go and look at insect and plants. But, being a sort of typical scientist and being a bit nerdy, I also have got transects set up there, and I actually go and monitor and record insects and plants that I find up there. And so I find some really lovely stuff, um, lots of plants, lots of beautiful stuff, lots of insects, lots of birds. And of course I keep a record. And so on some of these transects, I actually record, record the number of species that I have. And in just one of these transects, I have recorded the species abundance over time of the species composition. And one of the things that came blindingly obvious to me in the very early days was I wasn't finding everything. In fact, I wasn't finding many of the stuff in the early visits. And I only started to find, I'm still finding new stuff after 30 visits along these transect lines. And they're not small stuff, they're not ephemeral stuff, they're not new introductions or anything like that. One of them up around here is a three metre tree. And I had just walked past it so many, well, I walked past it 20 times before realising what I thought was one type of species was another. And so that was getting me an introduction to the problems to do with transects and finding species. And I thought, am I poor at finding things, or is this a generic inherent all trace? As many people know, I always leave my specs around. Um, but so, it came to me after I started work in this area or being interested in this area that other people have been working in this area as well. So this is a combination of this information that I'm trying to put together on how good we are, especially in surveillance. And just as a particular point of interest, we'll, we'll run out to a little test. And this is not one on the, the sheet or anything like this. What I want you to do is try and find the unusual letter in here. So we're going to start off with letters which we all should be familiar with here, A, T, G, and C. And I want you to try and find the letter V. And for example, as a particular example, there's the letter V. So what I want you to do is, on the next slide, when you see the letter V, just put your hand up. seconds into it. And about 15% of you have found it in 20 seconds. And already that tells us something very important. Because the longer you look, the greater your chance of finding something. But the rate at which we find it as a group is based on a normal distribution. So we can say, in this particular case, there's there's actually three V's up there. And there's 2,500 letters. So the, the, the density of V's up there is less than, or about half a, what a 0.1 of a percent. And because we know that the, the, the normal distribution of finding things, uh, because it's a normal distribution, at about about 20% found it in about 20 seconds, we can estimate that the probability or the time taken for half of you to find it 
would be somewhere around about the 30, 35 second mark. We can already, just from a simple one experiment, say that the average time to detection to find a V at a 0.1% level is about 30 seconds. Before that, we didn't have any idea how often that would occur or would be. This is the question, the first question on the sheet. So now I want you to think about something slightly different. I want you to think about this and count the total number of record or letters that you see again up here. So there's going to be ATGC. So you should finally find four, at least. There may be a V, there may not. And I just want you to count the total number of letters, different letters, that you see. Okay, so how many did you see? Write it down, please. So hands up if you found 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 8, prize. Come up and collect it afterwards. Right. 6. Well, done. well, there were 11 in here. So after 20 seconds, the outlier, the first person found six, but most, uh, eight, was it? Eight. So most people found six. So again, this is a type of uh, distribution that we can find. <coughs> Essentially, everything that we do in biology has a mathematical background or mathematical relationship. In fact, you know, some of these quotes are even something, if you can remember, think about Brian, Vo uh, Brian Fox's voice, you know, we all afloat in a hidden ocean of equations. And a lot of what we do in based on is we can have a mathematical relations, a prediction of what will happen, or model what we could do. And these everything include things from population growth, carrying capacity, square cube law, ratio of service derivative volume, inverse square law. This is one you can do at home. Inverse square law. The intensity of sound decreases at the square of the distance. So if you're in one room, and somebody else is in another room and starts yelling at you and you can't hear them, just yell back, inverse square law. And when they come to find out what you're talking about, you can explain to them how the sound decreases at the square of the distance. And then you can ask them what they were talking about. Bring them to you. Bit nerdy. Anyway, the other thing that we can do, or we'll talk about this, is that, has anybody heard of the Parento distribution? Or the law of diminishing returns, or the 2080 rule. Well, they're all a Parento distribution or a power law. And this means basically that you have a law of diminishing returns. Now, the Parento principle doesn't have to be 2080, it could be 2030, 2050, anything. All it indicates is that you essentially get your biggest bang for your buck early on, and then you get a, a decrease or re return on essentially the amount of time you spend. But this is the relationship that goes with the number of letters that we found, the number of insects or plants that I found at a protected quadrant. Because we know that the, the, re the relationship of that distribution, we can then sort of predict or model how many species should be in somewhere, how long it will take us to find these things. So again, maths, predictions, all based on a very sound basis of mathematics. Coming back to this talk of what we do in terms of surveillance and plant pests, at present, what do we report on when we go out and look at something? Definitely years ago, we reported on the number of hours we spent looking at or the number of visits that we did. But that doesn't tell us one key factor. How effective are we at doing that? We could spend 200 hours looking for something, come back and say, I spent 200 hours looking for something. It doesn't mean how good we are or the probability of us finding something. So again, here is another question. How good are we at finding things? If we search and don't find anything, these are the questions that are vital for surveillance, it's vital for area freedom, all sorts of components. 
If we search and don't find something, what is it, how confident are we that it was not there? Or how much effort do I have to put in to be 95% certain of finding it if it was there? And so I'm going to ask another question. Right? Let's assume that before we came into this room, you came in and you dropped something important, something small, a wedding ring, coin, money, car. You dropped it in, you walked out, and then you suddenly realised it was in here. Given that you've got five minutes before everybody came in, what do you think the probability is if you had five minutes of searching this room, which is about a 20 by 20 metre area, what is the probability that you would find it in this room? Is it, again, write it down, is it less than 30%, 30 to 50, 50 to 70, 70, 90, or 90 plus? Cindy, you should know the answer to this. <laughs> so five minutes searching in here, empty room, fairly easiest. What's the probability of you finding your wedding ring, car, room, key in this room? Okay. We could do that experiment if anybody wants to risk the wedding ring or car. Uh, Nobody does. Hmm. Anyway. Somebody, some people have done this work, Cindy and others, in this work, and they've actually looked at the probability of finding, in this case, a simulated weed within a 20 by 20 metre grassy area up at uh, Falls Creek. In this particular instance, an imitation or, or real hawkweed plant. And they found that roughly in a 20 by 20 metre plot, um, again, the same idea of these power laws that affect the distribution, whether it's grassy or shrubby, affects the probability of finding it at any given time. And so from this sort of relationship, uh, based on data, they found that there was a 99% or 90% probability of finding something in five minutes in a 20 by 20 minute area. That's pretty good. It also means that we can start thinking about how much time or effort we have to invest if we're going to look for something in this particular environment. It also means that you can, you know, extrapolate it out and say, if I've got a hectare area, how long do I have to search to be 95% that I would have found it in this area? Another example, and again, this is going to be a, a real-life example. Uh, a PhD student at Melbourne University was particularly interested in looking for the Japanese sea star up here. So she made some artificial, very, very close replicates of these, put them out in the sea in, in areas where they weren't and got people to swim a transect to look for and find them. So I want to ask you here, and I apologise for anybody who might get slightly seasick at this, how many sea stars do you hear? So this is a true transect that she ran. So look for these sort of sea stars. They're distinctive or should be distinctive? And count how many you see. So, write it down, this is so I can check up that it is true. Um, how many saw five? How many saw four? Three, two, one. Kimberly says there's five in here, so well done for those people. But, so what she can do is, based on doing numerous transects like this and getting people to count where she was, she managed to really work out the relationship between time spent searching, detection rates, and the probability of finding something. And so it fits into this power law where you've got your detection rate, your time, and E. And you can draw then essentially a relationship between search effort or time 
versus the probability of finding things. And she ran it at a couple of different sites. Uh, Tidal River, Anderson Leonard, and uh, another site where she used novices. Uh, but from this graph, you can work out for a particular search effort what the probability of finding something is. And so in her particular case, she found that Anderson Inlet, if you spent a given amount of time, you had a detection rate of 0.78, or 78% of the time you would find it for that amount of effort. So this idea of knowing this detection rate can take us one step further. If we know the detection rate is 0.78, of finding something, so that's the probability of finding something. What's the probability of not finding it? It's just one minus the detection rate. If you visit it twice, repeated, or two people did the same thing, the probability of not finding it is just the square of that value. So if two people visited it, you're down to a far less than 5% chance of not finding it. We can expand it further, and if we say, if we visit the site n times, the probability of not detecting it on any visit is then the nth power of the probability of not detecting it. Then the smart bit comes in, um, and so you can actually say then, if that's a probability of not detecting it on any visit, what's the probability of detecting it at least once on any visits? And that is 1 minus the probability of detecting it. And so now we've got an equation where we've got three unknowns. So all we have to do is define two of them, and we can work out the third one. So we can get to this idea of if we know the detection rate, and we visit it four times, then the probability of detecting it is over 99%. Or we can say, if we want to be 98% certain of finding it, how many visits do we have there? In this case, two. And so we can use this information for justification of area freedom or uh, extinction of a particular species, eradication if we want to do it, from a very simple equation. But there's a bit more complexity into it. From that C star work that you saw, you saw that there was a transit line and the species were set apart. And so obviously the closer you are or the object is to that transit line that you are moving on, the greater the likelihood of you seeing it. The further away, the less likely you have seen it. So again, you can model this relationship, and this is what Kimberly did. And she found again, as the distance away from that centre line, the probability of uh, finding something decreases. Again, it's just another relationship, and we can model it. And so they've done this work, for example, in lizards, detecting lizards on a different island, three species of lizards on this particular island, all very closely related species, all have different detection rates because some are more or less obvious or live in habitat that is more or less, uh, more easier to move through. So the main thing that are coming out from this third speed is that imperfect detection is the rule, not the exception. Up to fairly recently, we've been thinking, we find it, we, we're pretty sure that we would have found it. We're now realizing that imperfect or not finding things 100% of the time is the rule. And there's lots of papers and information about this. There's books, distance sampling, talking about how you monitor or talk about uh, abundance, uh, distance sampling as well. And so what I've done recently as part of a, a CRC project is sort of measuring or looking at how good we are at surveillance. And I was fortunate to have a few people here who came along to do this detection experiment. And we simulated a disease in a vineyard at a certain density and either have one, two or four leaves uh, infected by essentially a sunscreen and then ask people to try and find it. And what we found was that the more infested a plant was, the more likely it was detected. Almost 100% of plants that had four leaves infected were found. But if only one leaf was infected, there was less likely of it being found. But we could also then do this detection rate curve again and work out what the likelihood of finding a certain percentage of plants infected. And from this we can say that just over two seconds per vine will give us a 90% chance of finding a pest. Which means that if you wanted to search this particular vineyard, it would take you nine hours to have a 90% confidence of finding a disease if it was in this, if it's in this vineyard. Now, from a perspective of a, a manager, a biosecurity person, 
having that information of how much resources you have to allocate for a particular unit, how much it's going to cost, and what the confidence or effectiveness of that surveillance is, is vital. But we're not really doing it. Or generally in Australia, there are some exceptions, and Mark Meebold is one of them. We're also doing, as part of another CRC project, looking at insect traps and effectiveness of insect traps to capture long-distance dispersal of pests. And so we're comparing existing practices of using sticky traps or interception traps and comparing it with two new novel designs, traps. And we're setting these up in Victoria, New South uh, Victoria, Queensland and Northern Territory. And we're going to be doing some work on that to see, comparing it, and whether they can be used um, actually to look at um, insects blowing into Australia uh, from the top end as well. But it comes to this aspect of when we place or find a trap, and Brendan actually gave a very good talk at the CRC Symposium earlier this week about this aspect of we can either find something or we've got an absent case where we're unsure whether it's there or not. Or we say, it, we didn't find anything, but what does that mean? It could mean that there's a true absence, it's not there, or it could mean that there's a false absence. And if we make the assumption that if it's, we don't get any false positives or false um, uh, presences, that we've got 100% identification capacity, we've got these two things. So we either know it's there, or we've got some uncertainty associated whether it's there or not. Well, I was chatting to Mick McCarthy about this, who's another person that works in this area, and he suggested you can work out your detection rates of traps um, by having two traps out at one spot. So you get, if you have two traps, you'll either have both, nothing in each, one in, you know, you'll both get presence in both of them, or occasionally you'll get a presence in one and an absence in another. And this sort of ratio, of the ratio of these and these, can give us the probability that you're not finding it, but it is there. This moves into an area of conditional probability in Bayesian theory. And only recently have we had the, essentially the computational power to do some of this work. Now, we normally deal with probability in very distinct terms or very easy terms. For example, what's the probability of getting two heads in a row or the probability of rolling 11 with two dice? Those are normal probabilities which we can think about. Conditional probability is a lot harder, but it's essentially what we deal with in every day. We deal with this, what's the probability of this happening given that this has happened? Given that this today is a catastrophic fire conditions, what's the probability of a bushfire? What's the probability of a, a shark attack if I don't go in the water? Zero. But if you say, what's the probability of me getting eaten by a shark? You have to think about a different perspective. And so here is another question that you have to fill in. So this is, again, a conditional probability. This in case is a disease. So let's say you just accidentally, or not accidentally, because you go to the blood, give blood, or you go to the, den, the doctor, and he just takes a blood sample and says, we've got a couple of new tests, we'll just run them through, you don't have any symptoms, but we'll just see what happens. And he comes back and says, one of our tests comes up a positive for rare disease. Now this disease only occurs in one in every 200,000 people in, in Australia. This test is 99% accurate but it has a 2% probability of giving you a false positive. So what is the probability, now, if you can think about it, what is the probability that if the test is positive, that you do have the disease, given that it's 1 200,000 people in the population have it, the test is 99% accurate, and you have a 2% chance of being false positive. Is it high probability that you have it, low probability or very low? And if you're good at maths, you might be able to work this out. I can't. Not in my head, anyway. So, so what it is, you can do the maths, but the simple thing is, to get one positive, true positive, you have to test 200,000 people. If you test 200,000 people, you're going to have 2% of those 200,000 as being a false positive which works out at around about uh, 4,000 people. Cindy, 4,000? You can do the maths, 
This is the equation that you use, probability of a true positive and the disease test, and you can work it out. And it works out at less than 0 0.1%, 1 in 4,000, 1 in 6,000, I forget it is, 1 in 10,000. Right. It just, you know, it's very hard to do conditional probability in our minds, but this is some of the work that we have to do, is if we're doing, it, if we're doing surveillance and we have to work out what's the probability of us not finding, given that it's there, it's essentially the same sort of question. And these are the, the processes that we can use. Other work being done in Australia has focused on the aspect of how good are we at surveillance using different organisations or different people. And this is work done in, South, in West Australia by Daryl Hardy and a group of them over there. Who, groundbreaking work. And again, the same thing. They simulated three different types of diseases on particular plants and got groups of different people, volunteers, departmental staff, employed contractors, to actually carry out this level of um, surveillance for this. And so the question I'm asking, I'm going to ask you, of these five factors, which is the one factor that does not affect detection rate? So given that you're young or old, you're employable, you've got lots of experience, you know, male or female, or the type of pest, what is the factor that does not affect your detection rate? The only one that does not affect is your gender. Bad news for all of us oldies, young people do better. If you've got a young person with a level of experience, they're going to do better than the older person in finding things. However, they may, if they have less experience, have an increased false positives. So if you're going to use somebody to look for things, you should possibly look for somebody who's younger, um, with some level of experience, or train them up to get that experience to look for that particular pest. And similar results have been found by other people. Martin found that with the giant pine scale work as well. That quite quickly, novices can get enough experience to find fa a fairly easy pest, in this case giant pine scales, as good as qualified entomologists. The other way, if you don't have or can't run an experiment, you can use group theory to come up with it. So group theory says essentially the wisdom of the crowd, the average of uh, value of a crowd, is going to be better than the average of any individual. And so there's a process that's been uh, built up at SEPRA, at Melbourne University, that uses an idea or Delphi process, is where it uses group consensus or group decision-making process to estimate the true value of certain things. So what I want you to ask you now is, last year we had an outbreak of Russian wheat aphid in southern Australia, and it has an impact on crops, or cereal crops, by slight discolouring, and as the plants get older or more mature, they fall over, uh, or have a curled edge leaf. And so there is some distinctive indications of it. So what I want you to use is this principle, so using that first, again, question in that thing, is saying, Assuming that you are an agronomist, you're being paid by the farmer, amongst other things, to evaluate or assess the pest levels of his, in his farm. Let's assume that there is a 1% infestation level in there. The farmer doesn't know it, the agronomist doesn't know it. So 1%, one in every 100 plants is infected, but it's not one in every 100, it's usually clumped all around. He's got to survey 100 hectares, he's got 15 minutes what do you think on the scale of detection rate between 0 and 1, where 0 is we won't detect any, or 100% we will be always detected, what do you think is your mean detection rate for an agronomist, so a qualified person who's got pest experience, who's got uh, ability to estimate the impact or, of, on wheat, um, of finding it in a 15 minute search? And I want you to give your mean value of what you think is the average, Please. And then how confident you are in terms of an upper bound or a lower bound. And it doesn't have to be normally distributed. So you could say, he's got a 50% chance, 0.5, and I think 80% upper limit might be 0.8, but the lower limit might be 0.4. So your 80% range of your upper and lower bid based on there is a 1% infestation level limit, they don't know, there is a level of impact, so not a, a really high impact, but there is a level of impact. He only has 15 minutes to survey 100 hectares, and he's looking at ground levels and he's walking through. 
what's the probability that you will find it in that 15 minutes? Upper and lower bound. So again, somewhere between zero, somewhere between one, and an upper and lower bound. At a 1% infestation of a 1 in 100 climate shock. Now, this is part of a crop safe program which Martin Ebels along with Zebra was doing, and they actually asked over 100 agronomists in the crop safe problem who have an average of 15 years' experience looking for pests what their estimation was. And so their results say that they think they have got about a 0.4 probability of detecting it and an upper and lower bound of this. Now the Delphi or IDEA process is now an iterative process that says given now prior information your next estimate of mean value and upper and lower bounds will be influenced by essentially the group's previous decision making. So now knowing that prior information Look at your values that you've put in for this question and now estimate what you think your mean and upper bounds will be now that you have this prior information. This was done again and the answers were It meant that what was important is that this mean value moved a little bit, but more importantly, your confidence got tighter. And so the group decision theory is that this is a closer tr to the true value of detection rates than here, just by essentially working through a workshop session of a wise community, people who work in biosecurity or surveillance practices. Now I'm going to ask you, what if we change the infestation rate to 0.1%? So this is now 1 in 1,000. Given that this is the estimated percentage or detection rates for 1% level, a 1% level, a 0.1% should be harder. So now I want you in question 7 to fill in what you think your mean value and your upper and lower bounds for 0.1% infestation rate. Given that this is for 1%, is it going to be harder or easier, sorry, easier or harder to find a 0.1% infestation? Now obviously I don't have the data to show you what the results were. That's why you're filling out these sheets and why we're analysing the sheets at the end. And this will feed into some of the work that Martin Nibbles is already doing in this area. So that's two ways in which you can, you can actually do detection experiments, you can do expert elicitation, but are there other tools that can help in terms of finding the plants with plants? The main thing is if we're going to use new, and new tools and technologies, they've got to improve what we're actually doing. They've got to be more cost effective, more economical, cover more area, or complement or improve these, but there may be limitations with it. So what I've been doing is some of the work is looking at new tools that we can use to help improve detection rates. So this is work that Cindy originally does, looking at how humans can find this uh, state prohibited weed, uh, hawkweed up in the Falls Creek area, and they've got this sort of data. More recently, over the last few years, they've been testing sniffer dogs on hawkweeds. And if you really want to find out any more information, Cindy's been doing a lot of this work in conjunction with Angela Constantine and Parks Victoria. So what I want to do is ask this question to you, all right? Who was better at finding hawkweeds? Was it the dogs, whether it was two dogs or one dog? Was it the people, or is it possibly a combined effect that using people and dogs is a better or improved way of finding hawkweeds? And it's for, for doggy people, sorry. Um, Jennifer, this is all about dogs. <laughs> For doggy people, it's really great to work with dogs. And we know that dogs are very good at finding things through quarantine uh, processes. So, 
the results were initially one dog had a low detection rate. When, we, when uh, phase two, one particular dog was slightly better, but there was more range. The second dog was actually pretty good, but how did that compare to people? Well, in phase two of this, people were roughly equivalent to what one of the dogs was. So slightly better than some of the dogs. But as what Cindy found is that what's really interesting is did the dogs and people find exactly the same plants? And they didn't. About half the plants were found by both dogs and people. But there were ones that were found by people, but not the dogs, and ones found that by dogs and not the people. So in this case, they're complementary and can find different things. Cindy will also tend to experience how you else can find hawkweed accidentally by going for a leap behind a bush or going for a walk elsewhere. But, so there are ways in which you can find it. The other thing that you can use as a potential tool is using UAVs to find differences or indications of uh, plant pests. And this is another plant biosecurity CRC project that I'm involved in, evaluating UAVs or drones or remote sensing from everything from satellite to fixed wings to multi-rotors to find pest organisms and how good they are at finding them compared to existing practices. And so this is a, a, a run that we did in uh, just in February this year um, over a phylloxera infested vineyard. Um, you can see they're in phylloxera infested areas quite easily from the sky. Um, this is a drone, multi-rotor drone fitted with a hyperspectral camera. It's quite easy to see where the, the real high level impacts of phylloxera are having. But phylloxera is, has been in those areas for about five or six years, and it's quite visible. So you don't need a highly expensive machinery to see something like this. But what we're using it is, can it, we find it at the very early stages of uh, infection or incursion? And there's some indications that we can. Kevin Powell has done some work previously at looking at the hyperspectral uh, ranges of the reflectance and finding that there are differences between infected plants and non-infected plants in the under six months since infection. And we're starting to get some interesting results. We definitely can pick up differences between grape varieties and we are looking as if we can compare or, or pick up infestations of phylloxera at early ages, but watch this space. We'll probably have a paper out within a year on this. So, the other thing that you can use, um, rather than doing expensive uh, surveillance and monitoring and using hyperspectral cameras, which could cost over $100,000 each on UAVs, is much more easy just for surveillance practices. This is a PhD student over in Kansas State University who was looking for hessian fly. This is a pest we don't have in Australia, but he's monitoring this. When you're actually on the ground, it's very hard to actually find it. But just by having an aerial image, you can quite easily see the impact where the hessian fly is having. And now drones are getting so cheap and so easy the new drones are around about $1,500. They fit into your hand. You basically can throw them up in the air almost. You get a live feed to your tablet. David Smith is working in this area at the moment. And you can see, as you walk along, an aerial perspective. That's a great surveillance tool to have. It gives you this different perspective, different paradigm, and enables you to have or an increased chance, potentially, of finding a pest. So how can we apply it to our case in this particular instance? If you were back into this wheat field, you were looking for Russian wheat aphid, which changes the behaviour of the plant and it changes the reflectance of it quite well. This is just an aerial imagery, it was just a, uh, you know, red, green, blue image. This doesn't give you much information about what you could do. But just by changing one of the sensors and having an infrared image, this shows you potentially as something that might assist you in doing it. So let's go back to this question again of what is the detection rate. Let's say you had, again, 15 minutes as a 1% infestation level. This information prior to walking into the infestation. How does that change your values, again, on the mean, upper and lower bounds of this detection rate? So please think about, from your previous questions, question I think six, how does having just this level 
of information in your hand prior to walking out into the field, how does that change your likelihood of finding something? In this particular case, this is a, an example from Kansas State, Kansas University on, uh, what should we can? Um, I think it is sugar cane, I think. Um, that is actually, these darker areas are sooty mold that's created feeding on the honeydew or from the aphid. So just for in this particular case, that would give you a great case if you could link it to the biology of an insect. Again, what do you think at a 0.1% level, what would your detection rates change if you had some level of prior information that might give you some indication. Again, mean, upper and lower bounds, please. This again is a decision-making process. So this is our expectations of what we think UAVs might improve, do to our surveillance. We actually want to do now is go out and do a field test on this, where we actually take the people out, do the examples, get them to do the detection works, find out the percentage of things, give them prior information and actually find out how it is. So we're testing two things. We're actually testing whether UAVs work and how they improve it. And secondly, we're testing how group theory estimates probabilities. Now there's a whole range of new technologies that are coming out in uh, UASs that can aid or help in surveillance by security. There's tools developing for grasping or bringing back samples. There's instruments where you can drop pheromones or, or insecticides on things. There's instruments where you can collect or pick up things or suck some things up. They're all going to be developing coming out very soon in terms of aiding it. Which means if you're going into a quarantine zone, rather than having to go through this disinfestation process, potentially you have the ability to send in a drone to pick up the sample and bring it back to you, or at least give you a visual estimation of what's happening in there. The other thing that we've actually been using aerial imagery in a lot of cases, or actually aerial zones, is sharks. And they give you confidence. When you see the helicopter going past and you look down, you don't get any warnings, you feel a bit more confident. It's actually a good process. We use it all across Australia. And it has the ability to pick up sharks in these cases. More recently, drones are now being used by surf life-saving clubs. Again, for the same thing, shark surveillance. Um, they, they did have a little problem. One of the first drones that was released and went out didn't come back and they said it was a, you know, they made a mistake. They may have put Northern Hemisphere coordinates in it. <laughs> Never came back. So, a human error. Human error. Not the fault of the toy or the uh, uh, tool, but the fault of the people using it. So how good, then, the question, how effective is shark surveillance. Well, a group up in New South Wales actually went out and did this. They got a dead white pointer, cut a, uh, a silhouette of it, and made it up in shapes of three different sharks. They made hammerheads, they made great whites, and they made um, uh, mako sharks, I think it was. And they put them in the water, and they saw how good the helicopters or the fixed wings were out finding these sharks. They first of all worked out that basically you couldn't see them below five meters. So they put them between one and four meters in depth of water at ranges, distances out from the transect lines that the helicopters would, um, things were using them. It's a normal practice. So the question is how good were these helicopters and planes at finding sharks? Was it High likelihood of finding it, low likelihood of finding it? A question. So they did the experiment, they got the results back, and what did they find? They found that only 10 to 20 percent of sharks were found. They found nothing under three meters, basically under water. Helicopters, no, planes were slightly better than helicopters, or vice versa, I forget about that, right? And they didn't find any ones that were greater than 300 metres away. And they came out with this recommendation, it says, what is, this, what is the utility of a program that only finds 20% of sharks? Good question. Maybe it's been seen to be doing something, 
rather than actually worried about how effective you are. One new tool that has great potential for both conservation and for surveillance for invasive species is eDNA. And Mark Blackett here, as well as Brendan Rodani and everything in this group here, are leaders in this field. But more and more organisations are looking at eDNA as so that sampling the environment for the presence or absence or even potentially abundance of particular species that can be picked up in water or soil or pollen. There is a lot of interest in this area. They've been using it for plants, they've been using it for things. Melbourne Water is investigating the use of eDNA to work out the rare and uh, distribution of rare Galaxia species, the distribution of platypus um, in, in the waters. And so there's a great potential. It's even used for smooth newts, invasive species in Victoria as well. So this area has a great potential for looking or supporting. The same thing as the values. What is our detection rate? How effective is this potential thing? The good diagnostics tools will help us with that. So, and finally, the take home messages I want you to get from this is that remember, imperfection detection, imperfect detection is the rule, not the exception. We're not very good at finding everything. But if we're going to be effective at our surveillance practices, we have to know our detection rates. There is good, sound, theoretical, and mathematical basis for our things. We can do easy to do experiments, field experiments, or elicitation, or a combination of both to work out different detection rates of different surveillance practices. So we'll answer these questions is, if I search for something, how likely am I going to find it? Or how likely am I to sure that it isn't there if I've searched? And this is information that will really support surveillance as well as supporting decision makers and allocating resources. And if there's two equations, I want you to remember it's these two. And they're the basis of detection rates experiments. And remember, we have the ability to either be seen to be doing something, or we have the ability to be seen to be doing something and know how effective we are at it. And I know which path I'd rather be on. Thank you.